Hello, listeners. This is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number one, ready for teaching on October 7. This week's lesson is titled God's Mission to Us, Part 1. It's from the series God's Mission, Our Mission. The lessons have been authored by the directors of six global mission centres around the world under the leadership of Dr. Gary Krauss of Adventist Mission. Your reader is Percy Harold. And now from Global Mission at the General Conference, here is Gary Krauss, who is the coordinator of the writers of this quarter's lessons. Thank you, Gary Krauss. Years ago, one of our Adventist magazines published a parable about a dreadful swamp. As people passed along the path going through it, they were often overcome and fell in. Their dying cries could be heard all through the nearby village. It was terrible. The people held a village council. In fact, they held many village councils. Various theories and papers were presented analysing the cause and sometimes even proposing solutions. But nothing was ever done except to continue meeting and talking. Over the years, the discussions continued. People wrote dissertations on the topic. Guest lecturers were brought in. Yard sales were held to raise money so that meals could be provided to those who sacrificed so many hours sitting in these meetings. Eventually, money was raised to build a soundproof meeting room so that the cries of the lost and dying would not disrupt the ongoing discussions. But nobody did anything to help those who were in trouble and nobody did anything to try to stop more people from being lost in the swamp. They just talk. The church as a whole, and your Sabbath school class in particular, don't want to be like the people in that village. We love our time together to pray, think, share, and discuss. But we long to go beyond this and actually do something for and with those around us. We want to make a difference in our communities and around the world. We want the work to be finished, and we want Jesus to return. This quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide is designed to focus attention on getting out there and doing something. We will examine many wonderful Bible stories. We'll read about exciting experiences and illustrations. We'll learn about available resources to assist us in reaching out to our neighbours, especially to those who have no Christian background. But those will just be ways of illustrating and motivating us. The real focus, the real heart of each lesson is what will be shared on Thursday each week a challenge to get out and actually do something. We'll share theological insights and provide tools and ideas for you to work with, and each Thursday's portion of the lesson will issue a careful progression of challenges. It will begin with what's easy, and as the quarter goes along, there'll be subtle and not-so-subtle increases in the challenge. The goal is for each of us to take the challenge Pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us, apply what we've learned, and then spend a few minutes in the next week discussing how it went. This isn't to be a time of boasting, but a time of sharing, both about what went well and what didn't. As we share, the group will generate ideas. Prayer lists will grow, personal and collective. In the end, it's our desire that this quarter will be remembered but not for memorable thoughts, engaging stories, or deep theological concepts. These may be there, lots of them, but it's our desire that we'll all look back on this quarter as the time when the Holy Spirit took our humble efforts and worked mission miracles for the honour and glory of God's name. Global Mission Centres were first established by the General Conference in 1980, They operate under the direction of the General Conference Office of Adventist Mission. There are currently six centres. Their purpose is to help the church more effectively start new groups of believers among the major non-Christian people groups of the world. At the time of this writing, the directors of these centres, Petrus Bahadur, Richard Elifair, Kleber Gonsalves, Cliffman Shamiruddin, Doug Venn, 
Amy Whitsett, Greg Whitsett, assisted by Gary Krauss, Director, Adventist Mission, Homer Tricartan, Retired Director, Global Mission Centres, and Jeff Scoggins, Global Mission Planning Director, collectively authored this adult Bible study guide. For more information, please go to www.globalmissioncenters.org. Sabbath afternoon, September 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have a part in what happens here on this earth. You have given us the opportunity, once we get to know you, once we give our hearts to you, once we follow you, to become part of spreading your word to those about us. And we call it your mission. And Lord, as we begin this series of lessons, to find out what your word says to us about how we can be part of that mission, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we open each word, as we open each text, as we open each chapter and book in the Bible. May your grace and your love be shared upon among us through the Holy Spirit, expreading your word. Lord, today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in various parts of the world, for Ladia Vanessa from the USA who listens on iTunes, for Michael and Tanya Habib in Sunshine Beach, not far from where I live in Queensland, Australia, for Ignacio Navarrete from Monica Malcolm, for Janet Mondando of Zambia, for Mashava Norton and Natasha Parker of Guyana, for Advenicilla Gosi from Brazil and Rogelio Martinez from Mexico. Lord, wherever we're listening, whatever our circumstances, we know we can put our trust in you. And this week, I pray that each of us may know your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Let's read that again. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Mission finds its origin and purpose only in God. This mission did not begin with Abram's call in Genesis 12 or with the Exodus in Exodus chapter 12. It did not even begin with Jesus Christ on the earth in Matthew chapter 1 or with Paul's missionary journeys in Acts chapter 13. This mission began with God himself when he brought the universe into existence and later created humanity. We read in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. In the scriptures we see a God who intentionally reaches out and desires to be with his children. From the beginning he establishes a relationship with Adam and Eve. Even after sin enters he continues his mission. But now it is to re-establish his relationship with humanity. In the end, God's mission will be accomplished, as we read in those two beautiful chapters at the end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, which is why we should be motivated in the work of proclaiming the everlasting gospel to the world, as we read in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. The foundation of any mission endeavour, therefore, must be centred on a relationship with the Creator and with the proper understanding of His missionary nature and character. But before we understand the mission of God, it is essential to better understand the God of mission. Sunday, October 1, The God Who Reaches Out to Us 
God created us in his image and likeness. He gave us a perfect world and his purpose was that we should live in perfect connection with him, a relationship centred in his most precious attribute, love. But for love to be real, God also gave us another precious gift, free will, the freedom to choose which way to follow. Of course, God gave clear instructions to Adam and Eve about the danger and deadly consequences of disobedience in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Let's read that. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die." Satan, in turn, deceptively persuaded Eve that she could eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but without any negative results. On the contrary, he claimed that they would, as it says in chapter 3, verse 5, be like God, knowing good and evil. Unfortunately, Eve chose to eat and gave the fruit to Adam, who made the same choice. The perfect creation, then, was stained by sin. That moment changed God's original plan and purpose for the newly created planet Earth. The mission of salvation, which had been designed, as it says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, before the foundation of the world, had now to be implemented. Read Genesis chapter 3 verses 9 through to 15. What was God's first words to Adam after he and Eve fell? And why is that statement so significant theologically even today? Genesis 3, beginning at verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you were cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Of course, God knew exactly where they were. Dominated by fear, Adam and Eve were the ones who needed to see what was going on. But they also needed to be confronted so they could understand the dreadful consequences of their sin. Satan also needed to be defeated. For that, God then began to present his mission, the plan of redemption, as we read in Genesis 3, 14 and 15 again. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The only hope of reconciling the world to himself, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.19. We need to pay close attention, however, to the fact that before the confrontation and the promise of reconciliation, God came looking for fallen humanity. In spite of the seemingly hopeless situation, God essentially addresses two issues in his question to Adam, our fallen state and his missionary nature. We are lost and in desperate need of salvation. He is the one who finds us with the determination to save and to be with us. So to finish today, throughout history, God continues to ask, where are you? In your personal experience, what does this mean for you and how have you answered him? Monday, October 2, The God Who Longs to Be With Us 
Read Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, Genesis 26, 3, and Genesis 28, 15. What was the main focus of God's promise to Abraham and his descendants in these verses? First of all, Genesis 17, 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And chapter 26, verse 3, Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And chapter 28 of Genesis, verse 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. In the Old Testament narrative, God continues to act according to his missionary nature in order to fulfill his purposes. For instance, after the flood, the people of Babel decided to gather in one place to build a city and a tower that would reach to the heavens. God intervened, confusing their language with a goal to scatter them around the world. As we read in Genesis 11 verses 1 to 9, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. He then enlarged his mission, calling Abram, who later became Abraham, to be a channel of his blessings to the whole world, as we read in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's promises to Abraham and his descendants were multifold, but one emerges above all. Several times God basically declared to them, I will be your God, I will be with you, I am with you. And we read that in Genesis 17 and 26 and 28 at the beginning of today's lesson. As history goes on, Joseph ends up in Egypt, but as an instrument of salvation to God's people. In every step of Joseph's experience, even in the most difficult moments of his life, the Bible affirms that the Lord was with him. We read that in Genesis 39, verses 2, 21, and 23. And so we read verse 2, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And then verses 21, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And then verse 23, The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Generations later, in the fulfillment of his mission, God then sent Moses to Pharaoh as the deliverer of his people from Egyptian slavery. During Moses' commissioning, God said to him in Exodus 3.12, I will certainly be with you. 
Time after time, Yahweh confirmed his deep desire to be with his people. Read Exodus 29, verses 43 and 45. What was one of the main purposes of the Old Testament sanctuary? Well, let's read Exodus 29, 43, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And verse 45, I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God. God decided to be with his children in a different way. He confirmed to Moses his longing to dwell among the children of Israel in the building of the tabernacle and the establishment of a very intentional and purposeful system that would point to the ultimate instrument of his mission, Jesus Christ. Ellen White writes in the Advent Review and Herald of the Sabbath, December 17, 1872, the sacrificial offerings and the priesthood of the Jewish system were instituted to represent the death and mediatorial work of Christ. All those ceremonies had no meaning and no virtue, only as they related to Christ. End of quote. And so to finish today, what are ways that you experience God's presence in your life? Tuesday, October 3, the God who became one with us. The Old Testament presents how the Creator began to implement a plan through a people who were supposed to represent His nature and purpose to the world. Everything God did was according to His missionary strategy. Through the prophet Isaiah, God said in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, saying, My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. In the New Testament, however, God's desire to be with humanity takes a new dimension. Through Christ's incarnation, what was only a promise in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15 becomes a reality. And in case you've forgotten what that promise was, Genesis 3.15 reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Read the narrative of the announcement of Jesus' birth in Matthew 1, 18-23. What essential things does this account tell us about God? Matthew 1, beginning at verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit." And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. God with us, Emmanuel. God had dwelt among his people within the sanctuary, and now he dwelt with them in the physical person of Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, with the birth of Jesus, God presented in concrete ways his continuous desire to be with us in nature and mission. The Son of God was fully human, and fully divine, and he is the one who affirmed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, in John 14, verse 6. Read John 1, 14 to 18. What can you learn from Christ's incarnation about God's mission to us? And John chapter 1, beginning at verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. God moved forward with his mission and then, through Jesus Christ, was present in the flesh among his children. The one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, as we read in John 1.14, fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies and, in accordance with the divine plan, became one with us, God in human flesh. The God of mission was continuing to accomplish His purpose. And so, to finish today, think what it means that God's love for us is so great that he would come to us in our own humanity. How should we respond to this love, especially in terms of mission to others? Wednesday, October 4. The God who continues to be with us. Jesus' life and ministry were God's ultimate revelation. In about three years, God was able to reveal more about who he was and what his mission was all about than in all he had done through any other method in previous generations. Christ was the perfect image of the invisible God, the one in whom all the fullness should dwell, having made peace through the blood of his cross, as recorded in Colossians 1:15, 19, and 20. In Christ, the missionary nature of God was completely made known. Jesus himself revealed his mission, saying in Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Read and carefully reflect on John 3.16. How do you see God's love and mission interacting here? John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Later in his ministry, when Jesus approached his last week of life, humanity's final destiny was at stake. The events that took place during those days connected the expectation from the past with the hope for the future. During the Passover celebration, which appointed to freedom from the Egyptian oppression, Jesus Christ, the incarnated God, gave up his life to deliver us from the bondage of sin. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Read Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. What is the promise we can find in the Great Commission? How does it bring assurance to us as we get involved in God's mission? Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Christ's death was part of the reconciliation process, not the end of it. Through his resurrection, Jesus conquered death and received all authority in heaven and earth, we read in verse 18. Based on this reality, he then commissioned all of his followers to make disciples around the world with an awesome promise. I am with you always, even to the end of the age, as we read in verse 20. And so to finish today, 
In what ways have you seen Jesus promise to be with you always, being fulfilled in your own life as you are engaged in mission? Thursday, October 5. The God who will come back for us. Read John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. In what ways is it connected with the end-time message found in the Scriptures? Let's begin John 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and... If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. During his earthly ministry, one of Christ's most precious promises, the blessed hope, reflects once again the Creator's desire to be with us for eternity. Jesus affirmed in John 14 verse 3, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. According to the Apostle John, the promise will finally become reality. Revelation 21 verse 3 reads, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. In the Desire of Ages, page 26, we read, The work of redemption will be complete. In the place where sin abounded, God's grace much more abounds. The earth itself, the very field that Satan claims as his, is to be not only ransomed but exalted. Here, where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men. And through endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift, Emmanuel, God with us. End of quote. Here we find the most beautiful picture of redemption. The God of mission will finally fulfill his desire to be with his children eternally. What a tremendous privilege to be part of this reality. Weekly Challenges Throughout this quarter, you will be invited to engage intentionally in God's mission. This will be an opportunity to see and experience the God of mission at work in your life. Take advantage of this moment for personal reflection and be ready to share what you have learned with your class on a weekly basis. Additionally, the Challenge Up will encourage you to increase your involvement in God's mission. And here's the challenge for this week. Pray every day of the coming week for God to open your heart to be part of His mission. And then there's Challenge Up. Learn the name of someone in your life you don't already know. A neighbour, a co-worker, a shopkeeper, a bus driver, a janitor, etc. Begin praying for him or her each day. Friday, October 6. From the Desire of Ages, page 22, we read, The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through times eternal, we read in Romans 16.25. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages had been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan, Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, as it says in John 3.16, end of quote. 
And then from the book, The Acts of the Apostles, page 29, Christ did not tell his disciples that their work would be easy, but they would not be left to fight alone. He assured them that he would be with them, and that if they would go forth in faith, they should move under the shield of omnipotence. So long as they obeyed his word and worked in connection with him, they could not fail. Go to all nations, he bade them. Go to the farthest part of the habitable globe and be assured that my presence will be with you even there. Labour in faith and confidence, for the time will never come when I will forsake you. I will be with you always, helping you to perform your duty, guiding, comforting, sanctifying, sustaining you, giving you success in speaking words that shall draw the attention of others to heaven. End of quote. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. 1. Think about what it means that God's first words to fallen humanity were not, What have you done? or Why have you disobeyed me? Instead, the first words were, Where are you? What comfort should this truth give us regarding God's intention for us and our loved ones? And two, think about what it means that God himself, in the person of Jesus, came to this world in order to save us. Christ on the cross was the ultimate manifestation of God as a God of mission. What does this tell us about his character? And three, the mission belongs to God. Therefore, he will equip and empower people for the task. In light of this reality, when you look at the challenges of worldwide evangelism, how can you deal with feelings and attitudes of inadequacy or fear? Two Boys, Two Prayers, Part 1 by Andrew McChesney Father was excited when he saw a new sign reading Adventist Maranatha School on a street in Conkeri, capital of the West African country of Guinea. He wanted his two sons to go to a Christian school, and this might be their chance. He never dreamed that the school would change his life. Father entered the fenced compound of the newly opened school and found a teacher. Is this a Christian school, he asked. Yes, she replied. This is a Seventh-day Adventist school. Father said his sons were studying elsewhere, and he promised to transfer them to this school. I want them to have a Christian education, he said. Soon the two boys, 11-year-old Junior and 8-year-old Emil, were studying at the Adventist school. Among their subjects was the Bible, and the boys memorised verses that Father, to his surprise, had never heard. He was even more surprised when the boys declared that the teachers worshipped in church on Saturdays. The boys asked if they could go to a Saturday program in a church located on the same compound as the school. Father thought it was an extracurricular program and agreed. The boys went to church every Sabbath for two years. Sometimes school teachers visited Father and invited him to come to church. Would you like to come to our church on Sabbath, they asked. Father always refused. No, I have to work on Saturday, he said. I'm very busy. One Sabbath, the church pastor Matthew told the church members, Today we will visit the father of Junior and Emil. A group of 15 church members, accompanied by a delighted Junior and Emil, arrived at the house. Can we pray together, the pastor asked Father. When Father agreed, the pastor asked if he had any requests. He did. Months earlier, Father, who led a non-governmental organisation, had applied to a Guinean government ministry for a grant, and he was still waiting for a response. The pastor prayed about the grant. Three days later, on Tuesday, the ministry responded. The grant was approved. Father immediately went to the school and told the teachers about the remarkable answer to prayer. He thanked God for the grant, but the answer to prayer did not convince him to go to church on Sabbath. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago that helped the Adventist Maranatha School expand in Conakry, Guinea, to the West Central African Division. Your 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will again help spread the gospel in the West Central African Division. Read the story's conclusion in next week.
Greetings, cyber school friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Cyber School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.